Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our culminating event for our Sage Stories 2 class. I'm Deborah Pascaret. I'm the Director of Creative Aging at the Wallace Sandenberg Center for the Performing Arts. I want to welcome you all here in our virtual space today. Um, you're going to meet some incredible writers this afternoon, writers who have taken several classes before, and this is uh, the most advanced class for the time being, there will be more to come. Um, and so they've had some prompts and some assignments that are a little more difficult, a little more complicated than some of the earlier classes, and their writing has been exquisite, and I can't wait for you to hear it. At the end of our uh, performance today, all the writers will be invited back and we'll have a short question and answer period. During the show, if you'd like to leave comments, um, please, you can leave them in the chat. And then also there's the Q&A um, function at, in the webinar as well. So if you have a question at the end, we're going to have questions from the audience. So please, either through chat or through the Q&A, put your question in um, and I will get to them and so we can answer them. So I would like to go ahead and start our show by introducing our first writer today, Gregory. Hi, thank you, Deborah. Hi, everybody. I'm Gregory, and my piece is written from the prompt, A Time You Felt Invisible. And my piece is titled, O oh Father, Where Art Thou? First they said, this is your father on your birth certificate. But it wasn't. Then they said, this is your dad on the marriage license listed with your mom. But it wasn't him. Then they said, by decree of this family court, this man will be your guardian. He will be your new dad. But it wasn't him either. He didn't know how to be a dad. I continued to feel invisible to him, while at the same time, I had become a target in the crosshairs of his angry and depressed, infertile, alcoholic wife. Over the years growing up, I always felt the resolve within to find my biological father. Harboring hurt and anger toward my biological mother for my unbelievable predicament of being placed with a guardian in an abusive environment as a child caused me to stupidly miss the opportunity of gathering all of her personal history for myself firsthand. I regret a choice I regret. I, call one, I recall one afternoon when my daughter first heard that I didn't know my father. She became emotional and felt sad for me. I told her that the fact that she knows her father is what's truly important to me. I've heard that Ancestry.com has for some people opened up a can of worms, but for others has been a godsend. I prescribed to the latter and in 2016 found information on my father and his family. But sadly, before I could find him, he passed. in 2008 at the age of 76. He did leave me a half brother from another mother who lives in Florida. I paid them a visit 
and they accepted me with open arms and warm hearts. It was so gratifying. They were as excited as I was and kept exclaiming about my similar matching eyebrows and height to my father. It was revelatory to me to see my face on someone else. My new family shared many stories of my father and helped me feel familiar and inclusive and answered my many questions. My half brother Craig has become a new best friend. I am humbled, joyful and grateful for my life's path and experiences that led me to finally finding my father. And now I'd like to introduce our next writer, Judy. Thank you, Gregory. Hi, my name is Judy. The prompt for my piece is a moment of silence and the title, I was hit. I was working as an executive recruiter in Los Angeles and covering large financial institutions located on Wall Street. I worked very hard to secure two high level search assignments from Goldman Sachs. After many phone calls with the Goldman Sachs hiring manager, I was invited to come to New York to be interviewed for the job. I arrived late Thursday evening, filled with excitement and anticipation of winning the opportunity to do the search. I had packed my best suit, shoes, and briefcase so that I'd make a good impression. Friday morning arrived, my hair was all coiffed, I was wearing a beautiful yellow suit, I was ready for anything. As I stepped on the escalator, going up to the office of Goldman Sachs, I heard a loud sound from the top of the escalator. I was hit. A woman had dropped her large suitcase and the suitcase came tumbling down towards me. There was nowhere for me to go. I was hit by her suitcase, knocking me down. I fell on the moving escalator, ripping my stockings, knees and skirt. I was a tangled mess. I looked as though I was in a war zone. Fortunately, an elevator engineer heard the screams and stopped the escalator. Slowly, I got off the escalator steps and I walked to a pharmacy outside the building. I was going to the interview, no matter what. I bought stockings and was given a wet cloth to clean my bloody knees. As best I could, I put myself together, and once again, I took the escalator to Goldman Sachs. When I arrived, the human resource director looked at me in horror. I asked her if we could have the interview. Silently, she scanned my body, taking in my bloody knees and torn skirt. She said, of course we can, come on in. We talked for more than an hour about the job description. She said anyone who is able to pick themselves up and come directly to an appointment after what you have been through has the characteristics of a determined woman. That's what Goldman Sachs needs in a recruiter to find the two wealth salesmen we're looking for. She congratulated me on winning the search assignment. She had interviewed four other national recruiters that day. It was a very difficult search, but I did find the exact right people for Goldman Sachs. I would like to introduce our next writer, John. Thank you, Judy. Hello, my name is John. The prompt for the piece I'm reading today was what I meant to say was the title of my piece, so this is paradise. She came into his life at the worst possible time. It was perfect timing for her, but incredibly bad timing for him. 
it was a moment of weakness, a moment in, in time that was filled with loss and loneliness. She was a pro picking up on all the signs and moving right into his wounded heart. She manipulated him into submission with the ease of a master magician. He found himself forgiving her over and over. And all the while the voice in his head was telling him something just wasn't right. He forgave her for drinking every night until she passed out, saying he loved her and would help her get better. She never did. He forgave her for her psychotic behavior, seeing and hearing things that just weren't there, accusing him of being unfaithful. He used calm compassion, holding her close, saying he loved her and would help her get better. She never did. He forgave her for coming home late at night, not knowing where she had been, smelling of cigarettes and liquor. He would help her into bed, gently brushing the tangled hair away from her face, saying it was going to be okay. He loved her and would help her get better. She never did. Over time, he lost track of all the times that he had forgiven her and for all the times he told her he loved her and that he would help her get better. And then she never did. The voice in his head had grown too loud to ignore. It was time. The note he left her read, I said I loved you, but I didn't. I said I would help you get better, but I couldn't. I said I would always be there for you, but I won't. What I really meant to say was goodbye. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce the next presenter, Megan. Thank you, John. Hi, I'm Megan. My piece was inspired by a prompt, The Door, Green Acres. Rickety, it creaked, peeling paint, a Dutch door, no lock. Looking upwards to the thatched roof, it smelled of dry grass, damp after rains. Mounted on the wall, a long wired farm telephone, our ring, five longs. One to the operator, who we're convinced listens in on conversations. Around the corner, the gas stove produces the most succulent thick potato chips and steak, cooked by Sam, the oft-times drunkish cook. A character who prides himself on his culinary repertoire, including lamb chops and mint sauce. Dining table is unbalanced due to the neighbor's German shepherd Simba when he jumped up searching for morsels. He also attacked the Encyclopedia Britannica's, ravaging the gold leaf edges, supposed to be safe between the covers. Everything is unbalanced. It all feels unsafe. There is a shotgun that is occasionally wielded, waved around, empty threats. Orange blossom scent fills the air. Why, oh why, did we come to Green Acres? formerly so benign. Daisy, the duck, quacks. Her beak enters the door. A poop on the floor. More mess. One day, the gas stove is no longer there. Our dad sold it for booze. Those were the dark days. Days I'd rather not remember. 
Though that door resides in my memory, dark, lurking, creaking open, and then closed again, I closed the door forever. I need not go back there again, ever. Now, there is a new door, the garage door, the one with the window in it. I see him sleeping. It reminds me of my father. I peer in and wonder, is my son okay? Looking so rumpled and disheveled, I thought I never needed to open that door again. This is a different door, but it feels familiar. I'm a grown up now. Not as afraid, sad, yes, helpless, full of despair, but more in control of my feelings. I would like to see that door close. I have a feeling it will remain open for a long time yet. Thank you. And now, Nina. Thank you, Megan. Hello, everyone. My name is Nina. And my story was written on the prompt, what I meant to say. I called it good deeds and misdemeanors. We had been sitting silently while our sixth grade English teacher had explained his brilliant idea to us. Now, he was exuberantly exclaiming, brilliant, right? Our sixth grade English teacher was a tall, charming, enthusiastic man. To me, who until American dad took over was dadless, he personified the quintessential must have dad. I suspected some of my classmates, given the chance, might have agreed to trade in their own dads for him. The brilliant idea he promoted so vigorously, English tea time for parents, real China, tea with milk, lots and lots of donated cakes, an entertainment review, and a quiz show. Well, well, brilliant. We planned, volunteered, gathered, contributed, memorized, practiced, invited. On the day, my auntie attended. My mother, earning our daily bread, all went brilliantly until my auntie called me over. We were one of each other's most favorite people. We also knew how to navigate one another's right angles and rough edges, usually. So it was with a slight unsettling premonition that I approached her table with a still cheery step. My auntie relished her role as family representative, fulfilling it with a certain pride and flair. She took her job seriously. Leave a good impression might have been her motto. So when she pinned her green eyes on me, and said without hesitation, I'm told that all these lovely cakes were donated by the parents. Why didn't you tell us? We'd have baked a cake. My brain melted. 
her sensibilities had been pricked, deeply pricked, and I had done the deed. My now vaporized good intentions had propelled me into this sudden predicament. My goopy brain had no noble reserves. My nearly inaudible voice managed an anemic, oh, didn't I tell you? As I saw her slow shaking of her head, I felt the floor open beneath my feet. And while I promptly tumbled down, 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 a jumble of words fell after me. I wanted to save the money. Would that have left a good impression? No worries. That voiceless void is just a mirage. Goopy brains recover. They recalibrate, regenerate, and re-emerge. So on our way home, my salvaged self said to my auntie, you know, I did some math. Each person was getting at least three slices. That is plenty. Why bother you with work and spending money? With a sideways glance and a squeeze of my hand, she said, Next time, just tell me and let me decide, okay? Okay. And now, please welcome my fellow writer, Jackie. Thank you, Nina. Yes, my name is Jackie. And the prompt was to watch a short Jacob Jonas film of a young girl crumping, which is a subvariant of hip hop, a free, expressive, exaggerated, and highly energetic movement dance. And then to write about what personal feelings and emotions were aroused in ourselves from watching her dance. The title of my piece is See Me Dance. She is me, I am she, the sad, forlorn little girl without solace in time or space, always staring outwardly into space with a sad look on my face dancing through anger with my arms hitting and my feet kicking in space. There was no solace. The anger showed on my face when people would ask me to put on a smile. I in turn said no to their face, which got me no peace, but put them in their place to get out of my space because I was not going to change the frown on my face. I had my reasons to be in such a sad place and no one was going to change me. Mind your own business. Your life is no better than mine. So do not stray past that line into mine. You think you know best, even though you are not me. So leave me alone. I am bored as you snore because you no longer listen to my horrors. You think you are important and no more, but I see you no more as an important chord in my musical score. I march to my own drumbeat, whether in or out of step, to keep pace with the music in my head. 
I may skip a beat, but I move along at a faster pace as I continue to dance in place. I have had enough time to explore my own horrors. And now I have a smile on my face as I dance at my own pace. Now it gives me great privilege to introduce the next writer, Judy. Thank you, Jackie. And my name is Judy. My story about a moment of silence is called No Outlets. Strategic preparation was essential to sail to Hawaii with a diligent crew of 13. Captain Klaus, his wife, and a four-year-old daughter came from Denmark. My husband, Steve, our three daughters aged four to seven, five wholesome guys, and me, ordained executive chef. Assembling the meals was calculated for a trip with no electricity or refrigeration. 14 dozen eggs, each sealed in wax and stored in the bathtub. A million cans of tuna, soups, olives, tons of cheese, and 20 loaves of pioneer sourdough bread that mutated to fuzzy green mold. Departing at our usual midnight, the first two days of calm abruptly deviated into an angry, vicious storm. Our holding tanks, filled with diesel, ripped apart flooding the main salon, emitting dangerous fumes, and forcing our return to Marina del Rey. Exasperated, we threw out the carpets, dumped the cushions, rigorously mopped and scoured, replaced the carpets, refilled the diesel into oil drums, barely regained our sanity, then set sail again defying the unpredictable currents. This time more desperate to meet the mandatory date, June 18th, 1969, for our scene in the film, The Hawaiians. In juxtaposition of our frantic beginnings, the sails captured the wind propelling us west in silence and the tranquil serenity of nighttime revealed a sky illuminated with a billion stars and the rippling reflection of the moon. Our 70 foot sailboat was indeed like a tiny cork, adrift on the infinite ocean in the midst of absolutely nowhere, accompanied by the perpetual consciousness of the unknown aquatic life, sharks, porpoises, dead bodies? Lurking just beneath the confines of schooner Isabel, even with expert navigation, hot baked brownies as our sacred salvation and persistent affirmation from those in control that we were secure and on course. The sense of isolation, vulnerability, and a substantial degree of blind faith was relentlessly present. Then on day 14, we awoke to a miraculous vision. Land ho! Maui. Maui on target. And fiercely salivating for mocha java ice cream and a hot, hot shower. And now I would like to introduce our next writer, Sandy. Thank you, Judy. Hi, everyone. I'm Sandy. My prompt was the sound of silence. The title of my essay it's first sound of silence, second sound of silence. I was sitting in the event hall audience, nervous, 
really nervous, yet excited when the first sound of silence came. That respectful, silent expectation from those waiting patiently in the audience to hear what comes next. It brought me out of my seat and I attempted to walk with di dignity and confidence to the stage. Then I slowly sat down at the dazzling grand piano. At almost 16 years old, this was my 12th and final classical music recital. I was to play the first movement, 10 pages long of the Be Beethoven piano sonata in C major. For a change, I have practiced diligently, memorized it thoroughly, and envisioned a grand finale performance. I took my time getting ready and finally began playing. I was focused and relaxed. And then about four or five pages into the sonata, Oy vey, I lost my train of thought. My mind wandered to the spring dance I'd be attending with a terrific date after I completed playing. A distressing sound of sign that came from me was probably two or three seconds long. But then a miracle. My fingers started playing somewhat similarly to where I had left off. There were arpeggios, trills, chords, and amazingly, they sounded as if they were in C major. Perhaps those 12 years of practicing scales and warm up exercises paid off. After playing those miraculous notes from nowhere, probably for about 15 to 20 seconds, my mind returned back to the musical notes of Beethoven. I actually enjoyed completing the rest of the sonata, concluding with a strong fortissimo chord. After playing that last long held court, 
there was surprisingly definitely applause. I stood up shakily, smiled in curtsies with relief. Then, uh oh, I realized I had to walk past my piano teacher on the way out. She knew I had a date. As I passed her, she said, quote, great improvisation work, unquote. And then gave me a look of praise, of understanding, and yet, absolute annoyance. I'll always remember those second sounds of silence at the piano as a singular time of focus, interruption, and finally refocus with a very special feeling toward that particular sentence. And I'm grateful that after those two or three sounds of silence, I didn't give up the music. I made it up. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce our next writer, Helena. Thank you, Sandy. I'm Helena. I wrote from the prompt, A Time You Felt Invisible. I titled it, I'm Hiding. My parents are standing in the living room while two of their friends I never met before, Marta and Frank, set up a machine that shows movies. It is 1951 and I'm almost five years old. I am supposed to go to bed, but no one walks me to my room and tucks me in. I stand behind the door to the hallway, and I'm as silent as a rabbit hiding from a rifle. The movie is black and white, and the pictures inside the screen jump like flies caught in an empty mayonnaise jar. Frank tells my parents about escaping to a place called Hong Kong, so they didn't have to go to camp. They talk about how they snuggled the movie to America. When the movie starts, I am excited that I might get to watch cartoons. Then I feel surprised and my eyes blink a thousand times. There are bodies resting everywhere, but they are too still. Some of the ladies have big tummies with babies inside them, like my mommy does now. Big men wearing black boots and uniforms march around with shovels. Mama starts to cry and looks away from the screen. I want her to see me hiding in the hallway. No words will come out of my mouth, and I try to move, but my legs are too scared. There is a thumping in my ears. No one comes to take me to my room. I wonder if my parents and their friends will fall on the floor now and stop moving, too. I am scared that this might happen to me someday. 
Sometimes my mommy comes to my room after I fall asleep. She snuggles with me, but her face is wet. I can feel her heart beat too loud against my back. She tells me in the morning that she has bad dreams. When I ask her what they're about, she tells me that some terrible things happened in a place far away. It happened to her family before I was born. The bad people killed her mommy and daddy. They killed aunts and uncles and even children. I ask if they will come here and kill us, but she shakes her head and tells me we are safe in America. My tummy hurts and I don't wanna eat breakfast. This makes mommy very sad. And she tells me many children starved in the place far away. So I should always eat my meals just in case. The movie machine in my living room makes a choking noise and the pictures go away. Mama goes to the kitchen and brings us cake and tea for my daddy and Frank and Marta. The grown-ups are speaking in Yiddish and English and I try to listen. Every day when I come home from school, I tell them I only want English from now on, but they forget. I have to remind them we are in America. On this night behind the door, I am completely invisible. If I close my eyes and stop breathing, I can make myself disappear. I will know how to do this for all the years of my life. And now I'd like to introduce our next writer, Lori. Thank you, Helena. Good afternoon. My name is Lori. Um, we were asked to write a story about a door. And I wrote a story about a little magical door at the end of my street, and I called it the little red door. There's a little red door at the end of the street, surrounded by glorious marigolds and mushrooms that speak. Right outside the door is Father Frog and lovely Ladybug. There's a gnome of a man that keeps watch at night and guards all the secrets that come out in sight. This door that opens to a tree world inside has been here long before any of us were alive. Somehow the magic keeps the neighbors set back in time with all the ancestors still to shine. When we are deeply and dreamily asleep, that's when the little red door opens and lets out a peep. With a crack of an opening and a mist of smoke in the air, soon all creatures wake to see what is there. Ants as soldiers march out the door and they pass the gnome and ask, what's more? What's all this for? Without a word spoken, the spirit of the tree floats out the red door and begins to see carefully and quietly with reverence, you see. It touches each and every being and blesses them all for the spirit of the tree is the greatest of all. As the wise old spirit floats around to see, its watchful eye washes its magic and restores peace for all to see. This gift of the tree sends out its energy for all to breathe just a little deeper and restore serenity and magic. The anchor of safety and feeling of home heals all that are within each and every home. As if no time has passed, but an entire night falls, it's time to journey back before they awake. The little ants begin their march back before daybreak. 
with the spirit of the tree floating graciously behind, they soon meet the gnome that has hurried them just in time. As the tiny red door opens, they make their way home. Not to worry, they soon will be safely in their home. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce our final writer, Frank. Hello, my name is Frank and my piece was written for the prompt, A Letter to Your Hometown. It's entitled, One Up on Icarus. Enough was enough. Scarlet Rose teetered on the edge of existence. She was standing on the rim of the canyon, wondering if she would have a few seconds of feeling like she was flying before disappearing into those hints of a thunderstorm that were brewing in the Southwest. Before making the final commitment, Rose remembered she hadn't written the letter. The letter that would be addressed to the town folk of her population 550 hometown. Did they really deserve a letter? Nah. She would just let the mystery of why take up residence in their incompetent intellect. After all, that family of snakes would always push the two for one apple special anyway. So why part the curtains of uncertainty for those who would never, fi who would never fail to find evil in the things they didn't understand? <laughs> Rose couldn't help but giggle a bit at the confusion she would cause. The lunch crowd at the Blue Bayou Diner would be throwing all kinds of opinions up on the wall to see if any would stick. She knew none of them would be kind. It was heartache. You know, that Johnny Owens boy dumped her. Nah, she just wasn't right in the head. It was her parents. They were alcoholics, you know. It was the drugs. Had to be. They all had it wrong. And Scarlet wasn't about to help them figure it out. Rose closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and tilted her head back. At that precise moment, a meandering collection of nimbus clouds sent down a few teardrops of rain that gently caressed her face. Tick tock, she whispered. Took a large step forward. And as eternity began to cradle her in its arms, Scarlet Rose began to fly. Thank you. Now I'd like to uh, invite all the writers back for a little Q&A. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Give yourselves a hand and imagine you're hearing all the wonderful applause coming from our audience members as well. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to invite our audience to um, ask questions either through the chat or through the Q&A, uh, which I think is working. I'm not sure because it's open. Uh, it's open, but there are no questions right now. But while we're waiting for the audience to perhaps ask something, um, I would love to, oh, we have Bravo. So proud of my brothers, Frank and John there. So wonderful. Thank you. We've got beautiful comments coming in from all of the audience members congratulating all of you. I wanted to ask a question uh, of you all. So this is sort of the, the next level class and your prompts were a little more 
complicated is a nice way to put it. Um, <laughs> I tortured you a little more with this one than maybe the last classes. What, um, what was your favorite prompt in this class? What's something that really made you think or made you try something new in your writing that maybe you hadn't before? Oh. Anyone want to answer that? I even asked a complicated question. Yes, Frank, go ahead. Um, well, I, I like what I meant to say because it, it just created a whole, it made me think a lot. Uh, and um, I really enjoyed that prompt a lot. Great, thank you. And we had a couple of people talk about that. Yes, Gregory. Well, um, I don't have a specific prompt per se, but the idea that writing this stuff from my heart and from my memory, I had no idea how it would affect me emotionally until I started writing it. And that's been quite a surprise for me, but it also has helped me uh, realize a lot of things in regards to that also. So it's really helped me quite a bit uh, doing the writing assignments and the different props have been fascinating. And a beautiful job, Gregory. Thank you so much. I know that that piece really emotionally affected you and you and you did such a beautiful job um, getting through it because sometimes those of you that that are out in the uh, in the audience world, sometimes it's so difficult when you start to read like everything's been fine. You've written the piece, you've read it in class even, and then you get to this point and all of the emotions, all of a sudden it's right here in your throat and how you deal with it is, is, is how it works out. And, and Gregory, I thought you did a beautiful job. So thank you. Thank, for that. Thank you. Uh, Helena, you have your hand up and I, I see I have a panelist hand. Oh, no, it went down. Okay. Um, but go ahead. Yes. Actually, I meant to, to raise my hand. Oh, you did, did not mean to raise your hand. Yes, I do. Okay, yes. So, Helena, go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Actually, my favorite prompt was, please unmute yourself. <laughs> please, unmute yourself. My, please unmute yourself because uh, usually somebody forgets to do that. And I, I always laugh because I'm usually the one that does. Anyway, um, my second favorite prompt was what I meant to say, and I have to say that all of them were incredible because some of us don't know what we're going to write until we start writing. And things pour out in a way that gets us in touch with lots of different feelings and memories that we never thought we could get back to. So thank you so much for all your help. This has been an incredible experience. Thank you, Helena, and thank you for your piece today as well. All of you, all of you. I mean, perfect, perfect, wonderful, good stuff happening. Sandy, you have a question, and then Nina. So go ahead, Sandy, and then Nina. I think the question about being invisible really made me dig, dig deeply, and I discovered it was okay and it felt good. Mm -hmm. And the prompt that she's talking about was they had to watch a short film on a whale. It's actually a true story about a whale who was, who it sounds like it's a, a, a fairy tale, but it's not actually. It's a real whale that scientists found out had a call that was not like any other whales. You know, whales communicate through each, through their calls to each other. And this particular whale, whose name is Blue 52, um, had a different frequency. And so he, he wasn't being heard. Um, and so they had to write about the feeling of being invisible or not being heard. And, um, and so there were some really incredible pieces that came out of that prompt. And um, so they had to watch that film. And then some people even went deeper and watched. There's actually a full length documentary. And I know, John, you watched that as well. So some of these things, you know, you start on one, you kind of go down the rabbit hole and you, and you start to look in and think about um, sort of the background of where the questions come from. And so I, you guys all handle things in such beautiful ways. Um, Nina, you had your hand up. Oh, well, I can't say um, that I had a favorite one, at least not at this moment, but I thought they were all rather ingenious because they work on so many levels. 
um, so that the writer had so many options as to how to approach the subject. And, uh, and what was good also was the times when you said, um, write three or four um, short paragraphs on a particular prompt and then choose one to write your story on so that one didn't necessarily take the immediate first thing that one thought of. So um, yeah, I loved all the various levels which, which then made everyone uh, respond to them in such uh, private and, uh, and different ways. It was so um, uh, varied, you know. Well, I'm glad. And this class, I was mentioning before, this class is so great at following directions that people actually did all, they did all that. When I mean, a lot of classes, I'll say, I want you to write four things before you go to the first, to what you're really going to work on. And people are like, I'm not doing that. But this class did. You guys really followed the directions. You jumped all the way in. And I really appreciate that because I think it brings you to a place that opens things up for you that may not have happened before. Um, we had a question from uh, Sabrina. Um, how long is the whole class series? So Sabrina, the classes are, this particular class is 10 weeks long. Um, and so this is our 10th week, the 10th, we've been together. Um, and so they had eight stories that they wrote or seven, I can't remember which, but they, and then they would choose out of those stories that were created just in this class as to what they wanted to perform in the final show today. And then we will get together as a class next week um, and have sort of a cast party just because we there's always a feeling of wanting to connect we we create some really incredible relationships in these classes with all of the uh work that's shared and the and the stories and personal uh personal journeys that are shared and so we'll meet next week um just to have sort of a cast party and connect with each other and then hopefully some some people will take the next class so people um it's been great seeing all of you in this class have taken other classes before to see your work grow through that time so it's been wonderful um so that's that's it so it's 10 weeks it's it's like seven weeks and then rehearsal. They also have a private editing session. I edit the pieces and work one on one with them. And then they have the, the rehearsal and then we have the performance and then we just have a, a get together afterwards. So so thank you for that question. Let me make sure I'm not missing any other hands. No hands are down. Um, and we uh, great. So any other, oh no, wait, it says q and I'm sorry, guys. I'm like the technical thing here. Oh no, I think that that's it. So I said answered. Okay, I see what happened. Okay, got it. The, the question has been answered live. That's what it told me. Um, do we have any other comments or questions from our audience? We had a beautiful audience today. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you all writers for your, your openness and opening your heart and and taking chances and writing about things that were maybe not that comfortable to write about and um i've loved having all of you in class and so um we'll sign off for today but you'll get an email from me and we'll we'll meet next week on our regular link and to our audience thank you all for being here and um one more round of virtual applause for these incredible writers yay, yay. Yep. thank you all like i said before oh it's it's a pleasure it's always a pleasure and you are you guys are so great and opening up and sharing and um it's a family where we create these families every time writers meet you know and it's it's a wonder i i can't thank you enough and just so the audience knows this we have people from Northern California from Canada. We have people from all over in this class who have come together. So we haven't actually met in person, but I feel like we've met sort of heart to heart in, in, in the space here and in terms of sharing the writing. And so um, it, it's as always been a great journey. So, and I always hate to see it end. It's that thing where it's the end of class. It feels like the end of any of you that have done theater, it's that thing when the play's over and you're like, no, this is my family.
So, uh, but but I will see you all again. And thank you. I keep looking like the audience is over here because it says the attendee list. Thank you, attendees, for coming and spending your time with us this afternoon. And class, I will see you guys next week. Victoria, thank you for your help. And everybody, have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.